Influencing popular culture, politics, and everything in between. The local station takes you ringside as we discuss the crazy world that is professional wrestling. This is Going Ringside with The Local Station. Hello there, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Going Ringside. Of course, spread the word to any wrestling group you're in. They were out here. Just I tell people, Google, YouTube, wherever. Just search Going Ringside. We're not hard to find. Today, I am very excited to let you know that we have someone special joining us on the podcast today here in studio. That would be the world's most dangerous man. Ken Shamrock is joining us today because he is starting up a new fighting venture called Valor BK. Shamrock is uh, really focusing on really starting it in Jacksonville. We're going to get into that, but we talked to him about everything, about Valor BK, his new venture. Also going to talk to him about some things like something you've always wanted to ask him, a dream fight, him and Brock Lesnar. Who walks away from that one? You'll want to hear what he has to say. We talked about his time going into WWF and eventually WWE and all the fights he's had over the years and some things you may not have known have happened to the world's most dangerous man in the ring who has essentially been fighting his whole life. So let's get right to it. Here is our interview, our sit down with the world's most dangerous man, Ken Jamrock. Well, we are overjoyed to jo be joined today by wrestling and ultimate fighting legend, Ken Shamrock. Ken, thank you so much for joining us here on Going Ringside today. Hey, appreciate you having me. Tell me all about your new venture, Valor BK, which has a, a big footprint here in Jacksonville. What is it? What's going on yeah, with that? Valor BK is something that um, came up way back when I started fighting, and I always thought the purity of striking and, and the grappling part with no gloves on. When I first started, that yeah. was it. Then they added gloves and it just felt like it got softened up. So I felt like when I had the chance, and obviously as I got older and, and started to retire, I got the chance to go back to the bare knuckle. And so that's how Valor came up. But not just going into Valor and just putting it on, I wanted to use my experience through the years on how to make it better. One, fan friendly. Mm -hmm. No cages, no ropes. So the people sitting down on the, on the floor that are getting good seats, they're getting good seats. They don't have to look through anything. The most boring thing in fighting, in, in boxing, is the clinch. So we took that out. So you're in Reno, Nevada now, I think is where you live. Right. And, but how did you wind up here in Jacksonville, Florida? How did that come about? <laughs> well, we needed a place to fight. And, uh, you know, obviously UFC and WWF came here and they had great support. Mm -hmm. Obviously me being a part of the history of both of those, uh, gave it great success, good support here. We figured, well, this is a great place to meet. Plus, we had good support from the FOP, um, the PAL, which we actually did tryouts the other day yeah. on. So it just felt like a great fit, and the fans here, they're great fight fans. So I see a picture about a year or so ago to during, during the pandemic of you with our mayor here in Jacksonville, <laughs> and I was sitting like, what it, what's going on? What is this? Was that kind of the early stages of you setting this up in Jacksonville? Yeah, well, first of all, with anything, you got to get it sanctioned, right? And so being able to go in front of him and being able to see what those are, and he uh, right away, he understood it. And so we, we immediately said, this is where we want to do our next show. Was the fact that Jacksonville also had another wrestling organization helping, like the, the kind of the culture is really centered around here as opposed to an Albuquerque or a Minneapolis or wherever it may be. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it's, this, this was really, for me, it was more about what UFC and WWF did here and the yeah. support that they got from the Jacksonville fans. That really is what sold it for us. Gotcha. So I want to talk about where you're at right now. You retired and we were talking, you couldn't remember what year, it was 17, 18, 19? <laughs> I somewhere. don't think about that stuff. <laughs> yeah, you don't think about that because you're not really retired. Right. You're still a very busy guy. Right, um, yes. So you started, was it the 90s or the 80s? And you were, did it, did it kind of start with MMA or UFC or what was it then? No, actually, I started in the uh, late 80s. Okay. Um, I was over in Japan in 88, 89, 90 with the, the group called Pancration, which was actually the very first mixed martial arts before UFC, before Pride, before any of it. Mm -hmm. I was over there doing it and became a world champion. And then, of course, into the UFC where it became very popular here in the States. How did you learn to fight? How did you get to this point? <laughs> I mean, you're a guy growing up in Georgia. You're a good athlete, but... 
it goes from being a good athlete in Georgia to being a world champion fighter. There's a big jump there. How does that happen? Well, I'll tell you, my whole life I've been fighting, you know, yeah. on the street, um, trying to survive. Um, then I got an opportunity to go to Japan and actually learn how to fight inside a cage with rules and, and regulations. And then it just kind of like for me, it just felt like that's the place. Fact is, when I first went into it, I thought to myself, because I remember way back in the day, my teacher said, hey, you were never going to do anything when you're fighting. And I was like, uh, well, I think that that's probably that's the only sure, thing I can do. Yeah, you absolutely <laughs> can do it. When did you get to the point where you're like, I can make a living at this? From goes to, you're probably not making a lot at first, to the point where, like, this is a profitable venture. I never thought about it. You know, when I got into fighting, it was because I loved doing it. And then after a process of getting involved in it and then managing your career and then realizing that you're a commodity and not just a fighter, um, that's when it really sets in. I think that was probably halfway through my career. I think historically in fighting in America, it was boxing for so many years. UFC eventually starts to come through on the back of you, but then you throw a swerve to the industry and you're like, I'm gonna try this wrestling thing as well. What was that like and how did that happen? Yeah, I'll tell you, it was a struggle because um, making that decision was really because at that time there was a, a struggle within the UFC about where they were going at that time. And I thought to myself, this would be a great time to be able to kind of do something else. And so I went to, to go do pro wrestling, not with the idea of understanding whether or not I'd be good at it, but I just wanted to try it. And the next thing I know, you know, I'm capturing the King of the Ring Intercontinental yeah. title but what came with that was negativity. I was being hammered by a lot of the UFC fans and a lot of the media from the combat sports arena for making that transition. They and of you course, were a sellout. Yeah, the sellout. But now look where it's at now. Yeah, absolutely. You, and I want to talk more about wrestling, but you just bring that up where it's at now, specifically <laughs> Endeavor and WWE, unprecedented. They announced this merger a few weeks ago. You know both worlds better than anyone, maybe ever. What is what do you take away from that? Yeah, I just think that, you know, especially from what I was able to do throughout that time, being in the UFC, being in the WWF and having success at both. To me, it's always been a natural and it, to see it actually unfold right in front of you years later where they're actually merging together. It's just crazy. It didn't happen even sooner. So they're going to have, they're kind of saying it'll be separate brands, separate companies. I'm guessing at some point there's going to be some overlap. Would you suspect there will be some overlap? Once the merger happens, yeah. there's no such thing as one company. They may brand them that way, yeah. but when you've got two, two organizations that are owned by the same company, you know it's going to happen. So like if you're, a, if you're an active wrestler, it would be obvious for you. Yeah, I'll go interact with the fighting guys. <laughs> do you think a lot of wrestlers would want to do this? Because a lot of them are not natural fighters. I think Many the, are, but not all. I think the real question is, is, is when the wrestlers are wrestling, do they realize they're wrestling or are they doing MMA? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so it'll be fun to watch. And I want to go back. So you go to WWF, was it 97? Somewhere in there? Yeah. And you're king of the ring, your IC title, and you're fighting all these guys what was it like? Um, was You know, I hear of other guys who kind of had a similar venture to you. They picked it up real quickly, but guys who have never fought before, they have to go, they have to get stretched when they're trained to be a wrestler. For you, I'm sure it was a little quicker. You were able to pick it up a little sooner than other wrestlers. You're talking about going from mixed martial arts into pro wrestling? Into pro wrestling, yeah, as opposed to a guy off the street who wants to be a wrestler, like let's say uh, uh, Steve Austin or someone who comes in and has to learn how to do it you kind of already were trained. Yeah, I already had understanding of it, but at being at that WWF level, which is WWE now, um, it's a whole new ball game. It's not the same thing as doing these house shows and traveling around, it's a different level. So I had to go to Canada and work with Bret Hart in order for me to have an understanding of what it is that was I was doing. Was it in the into. dungeon? Is Absolutely, that what they... it's Stu Hart even put me in a submission hold. I was like, what are you doing to me? You'll find out in a minute, kid. <laughs> He's probably like a 70-year-old guy at this oh, point. Oh, yeah, yeah, he made me tap. <laughs> I wanted to ask about that. So one of your most famous matches is you and Owen. Was that in the dungeon or in the heart basement, or where was that? Yeah, it was in the dungeon. He put me through the, the ceiling of the, of the gym there because it was only about probably eight feet high. Yeah. So he actually stuck my head through there. But that was a classic match. That was something it I was. don't think has ever been done. So I watched Owen Hart, and when I watched Owen Hart prior to that angle with you, he just kind of seemed like Brett's little brother. Not an overly tough guy, but I think he was a generally a tough guy, wouldn't you say? You Absolutely, know. no question. The guy had great wrestling ability, um, and by and, and just his heart only. The determination for him to be great was secondary to none. 
Sure, and you kind of de had a lot of feuds with the Hearts overall. They were probably, were they good for you to start with as opposed to maybe more of a green wrestlers? The Hearts were really strong wrestlers. Well, I think just the name alone for me to be associated with that and being able to go in and have matches with them is really what put me over. So talk to me about you developing your kind of character on camera. You're obviously, you bring in just credentials because right. they know you're the legit ultimate fighter here. But you were kind of, they would always say, Kenny's going to snap on camera, things of that nature. How did that develop? Didn't have to, man, because I was going to snap. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to change a thing, man. It was the same way I was in fighting as I was in wrestling. Okay. Yeah. And then you find yourself in a lot of different angles. You're in the corporation. You're with uh, the big boss, man, the big show, Vince and Shane and all that stuff. What was that experience like? Man, I tell you, it was like, it was, seemed like there was always a rotating door each time. Storylines were just coming all the time. In fact, in that time, it was like said, the attitude there. Yeah. There was a lot of stuff happening at high speed. And so be able to, to be a part of a lot of different things that were going on and me being in that top 10 echelon of wrestlers mm -hmm. really gave me a huge experience and a lot of great success. So tell me about, so when you were there, Dan Severn comes in and Steve Blackman both come in and they both yeah. seem similar in gimmick to you. Was that separate from you? Did they come in on their own? How did that process work? Yeah, I had nothing to do with that. That was a natural transition for Dan because Dan was already doing pro wrestling before he was fighting. So I think there was that was just a natural transition. And Steve, Steve was just an, one of those guys that was a true badass. I saw some a lot of stuff in the late 90s recently, and you had a lot of times taped up ribs, stuff like that. I didn't know, was that a lot of injuries you were actually nursing at the time, or what was that process like? Were you hurt ever when you were a wrestler? Yeah, I got hurt more, and this is going to be crazy. A lot of people don't understand this, but I was hurt more in wrestling than I ever was in MMA because I was good in MMA. I could beat guys in a minute, two mm -hmm. minutes, five minutes, and not get injured. Guys wanted to strike, I'd take them down, smother them, and beat them and take no damage. In wrestling, you got to go in and do a program, and you have to take so many things five days a week out of probably six weeks. And so that's, that's a lot of bumps you're taking, and your body just sometimes doesn't have time to heal. And that's where I was at, was I was going through that, that, that road trip. And then by the time I got done in six months, man, I had so many bruises and injuries. I needed a month to just recover. I want to move on to some of the other stuff, but quickly, I, I've got to ask you, because I've got, you know, legit tough guys as well as maybe anyone on the planet. So I want to ask you about some of the wrestlers that the fans talk about all the time. You said Owen, tough guy? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Owen was, wasn't a tough guy in, in a sense like you, you would be afraid of him, but he's one of those guys that could wrestle. He had enough skill set to where you didn't mess with him because he would give it back. One I was going to ask about, Ron Simmons, Farouk. Yeah, now he's he, uh, he, that guy is a. He, not only is he tough, but he's big and he's strong. And so, yeah, he was a legitimate badass. He's a guy that was, in, in my opinion, if he would have done MMA, could have done well. Kane, big, strong, not very, not not a lot of agility, but yeah. just a big, strong guy and scary. Undertaker, intelligent man, yeah, intelligent, absolutely, and longevity. The guy just kept going like an energizer battery. He just kept going and going and going. Steve Austin, clever, um, very good at martial arts, stand up, and another really? badass. Very good at stand up. Yes, rock. Excitement, showstopper, <laughs> yes. big time showtime. Yeah, he, you kind of get distracted by all the other stuff he can do. He, 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 could get, he had the gift to gab, man. You pick up a mic, man, and that star would shine. Did you guys know that early, or did it take a while before it was really recognized? Well, we didn't even know he could do that. And when we started our program, we were both just on our way up and building our characters. And no one really knew anything about his skill, his mic skills. And so when he did grab the mic, that's when you saw the star. What's it been like for you guys to watch what's happened with him? All the, all the wrestlers and ultimate fighters to see someone do what he's done. Yeah, you got to be proud because he comes from where you are. And uh, you always want to show support, man, because yeah, I, and me personally, I did the programs with him and helped him grow into that role. And I got to ask you one question I've been planning the whole time. It is a big question. I need to ask you, in your prime, you were Brock Lesnar. Come on, really? That's a no-brainer. It's me, no question. I mean, I know what he's going to say and all his things, and he's got to be that way. He's, he, he's a world champion. He's going to be confident. But I'm telling you, and I got proof of this, proof is in the pudding. He can't stop leg locks. The <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, so two years or so after you leave, Kurt Angles comes in and does the leg lock. Did that bother you? No. 
it's a compliment. Yeah. I think anybody that takes anything and copies it is telling you that whatever you did is important. So after you leave, how did your WWF departure leave? Did you leave? How did that work? I never, you kind of were just not there anymore and I never quite knew what happened. A lot of stuff went on, you know, in the WWF during that time and I had a lot of stuff going on outside of wrestling and, you know, I think it, it's not a, a secret that my first love was MMA. Yeah. And uh, I had to leave only because there was nothing there and I couldn't support the family and I had to do something else and wrestling became my, the other love. Um, yeah. But I always wanted to kind of come back and actually finish the end of that story because I felt like when I left, I hadn't really done everything I wanted to. So you leave WWF, you get back into fighting, then you're kind of back and forth between fighting, TNA, things like that. What was that like? You were just kind of l l going where, where the money was, where the passion was? What was that like? That was just kind of going wherever I got pulled. You know, it was almost like you, you just kind of lose direction of really what it is you want to do. And so basically what I was doing, I was just going where everybody, anybody wanted me. And I just go. And how are you doing now physically? You are in tremendous shape, <laughs> but with the amount of, pain you've endured for decades i'm stunned how great you look how how has that been like for you as far as recovering from injuries long term where, where are you at today yeah i i mean i feel great you know i mean obviously i've had a lot of injuries along the way with wrestling and in in mma but i think i'm truly blessed um to be able to kind of have the conditioning that i have and the shape that i'm in so yeah it's and, and all it is is really just eating healthy i don't really work out heavy i just maintain Mm -hmm. Do you, and then you do the fighting for a while. When did you get to the point where you're like, I probably need to retire from active fighting? Because you did it a long time, a lot longer than a lot of other guys who wouldn't go as long as you did. Yeah, I, you know, and I think that's, that's a question I'll probably never answer because I've never, I haven't retired. Sure. I just, for me, I think maybe it's because of the way I grew up is like, uh, the only reason why I ever got to where I was at was because I never quit or I never say enough's enough. And so that has always been my character because I would always make sure no matter what I would succeed. And I, and I did. And I, and, and I don't know how to stop that. I just want to keep succeeding. And so by me taking the time out to say, hey, everybody, I'm, I'm, I'm retired means that I'm not focused on what I need to be, which is Valor BK, um, because that's just a journey. Right. And that journey ended and I started another one. Doesn't mean I got to make everybody know that that one's over. So now that you're in Valor BK and you've got these young up and coming fighters, you're a great face for this company because <laughs> you're the one that uh, people immediately recognize. It is, especially since we've just seen this merger. I think it's a, a, a beautiful timing. Um, and uh, I'm glad I'm a part of this. I'm glad that I can be that face. And when you started to get the national prominence, you were deemed the world's most dangerous man. <laughs> what was that like to get that moniker? I mean, were people f afraid of you in day-to-day -day life, or what was that like? Obviously, they are in the ring. All right. Well, and I think anytime you get a nickname or, or a handle like that, you can't, you can't name yourself. Otherwise, it doesn't count. Sure. And uh, so I, was, I got that actually through uh, a, um, a thing they did on TV where they were trying to see what the world's most dangerous food was, animal was, okay. person was, and they just so happened to pick me. And, and when they did, I didn't see it as a good thing because really? during that time when um, no holes barred, not mixed martial arts, but no holes barred was out there, people didn't look at us in a good light. They thought we were like these barbarian killer guys that were in prison or whatever. Yeah. We didn't have a good light. So when that came out, I was like, hey, whoa, wait a minute. I got a family here. Don't label me that. And uh -huh. then they said, no, 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 no. We want to try to put this in a different light. And so when they told me what they were going to do, they were going to show my family, my kids, show the training. And we were going to try to try to get people to understand who you guys are as people. I was like, okay, that sounds pretty cool. I can take that. What are some interesting things that happened to you either in the ring or in the octagon or wherever that maybe people don't realize happened to you? Well, I would have to say the Brian Johnston uh, fight where I had actually broke my hand. Um, really? They had the bone I, almost coming through the skin oh where it just really hit splintered because I hit him so hard, it just splintered. And I ended up finishing the fight by choking him out with the other, the other forearm. Okay. And so I don't think most people realize that when I won How that fight. How do you fight, fight with a broken hand? Do you just push through the pain? <laughs> Very carefully. Very carefully, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, was that one of the, did you ever have injuries in the ring? Was that fairly common? Or? Yeah, especially in, the, in those early days because we didn't wear gloves. Mm -hmm. um, there was always something, cuts, um, lacerations, um, fractures in the rib. I, I know a lot of guys who had actually fraught, fought with, you know, some cartilage problems and some 
um, torn meniscus. I even did with a torn meniscus. So there was a lot of that happened early on. I don't think it's so much now because they only fight one time and they're good. But when you had to fight four times or three times in one night with no rules, it seemed like every time you made it to the finals, everybody had injuries. Why do you think fighting overtook boxing as America's big fighting sport? Because it's, it's exciting and you know, when you hit somebody with a glove, if you've got a strong chin, you can, you can fight through it and you see fights going the distance. When you fight with bare knuckle and you get hit with a clean shot, you go down. Tell me about what you guys have. So you eventually have an event coming on. You don't have it fully solidified yet, but where are you guys at as far as having an event that people can see? Yeah, we're, uh, we're looking to do the fourth quarter. Um, okay. so, like fourth I said, quarter 2023. Yes, um, and uh, like I said, we're really excited to bring it here to Jacksonville. Uh, we got great support from the FOP. Um, in fact, at the PAL, P-A-L, we uh, did training the other day, had a good showing. So we just really feel like Jacksonville is a great spot for Valor to be able to showcase Valor BK. Um, one question I want to go back because I want to get your perspective on the Endeavor buyout. Yeah. Vince McMahon is about 76. I don't know when retirement comes for him. Do you see him in this forever? I mean, what do you think would happen? You know the McMahons and you know how passionate they are. Do you think it, it's handed down or what do you think happens with that? I think Vince has a kind of a same mentality as any other successful man. They, they, they have the ability to just keep winning. And as long as they're able to do that, there's no reason for them to quit until he has a big loss or something like that, or where he's forced to have to step down. This man's going to keep rolling forward. And as far as Valor BK, are you ever getting in on that? Like, are you actively fighting this one? <laughs> no, man. I mean, like, I don't have any plans for that, man. I love what I'm doing now. I love being able to give young fighters opportunities to follow their dreams. I put a team together um, that literally goes all the way back to the beginning of Lion's Den, where we have a structure of guys that understand winning, and not just in the ring, but outside the ring. So I really love what we got going right now, and that's my focus. Ken Shamrock. Valor BK, thank you so much for joining us. The legend is with us here on Going Ringside. So I was so excited to sit down with Ken and talk to him about his career, his new venture, which will really be centered here in Jacksonville, which is exciting for our city. I was wondering uh, for a long time what had been going on. Why was he meeting with our city's mayor? Well, that answers the question to really start Valor BK, and he's been doing a lot of work here in Jacksonville for that. So it's exciting, and as you heard him say he'd take out Brock Lesnar if they had that dream match that we always wondered what that would be like, uh, hearing what he has to say about the Endeavor deal with WWE. Just such a fascinating perspective. Um, before we go today, I do want to mention something else that is going on here locally in Jacksonville. If you're in the area and hear this before April 22nd, we have a local wrestling event going on with USWA. They have an event coming up Saturday. April 22nd, that'll be at the Snyder Armory, and that is at 9900 at Normandy Boulevard in Jacksonville. You can search them at USA, USWA Jacks on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter for more information about that big event going on April 22nd here in Jacksonville. Wanted to make sure we mentioned it for you. So thanks for joining us for this episode. We will have another one dropping next Wednesday. We were so glad you could join us today for this episode of Going Ringside with The Local Station. This has been Going Ringside with The Local Station, brought to you every Wednesday on your favorite podcast player, on New Sport Jacks Plus, as well as the New Sport Jacks YouTube channel.